Welcome to the OCR Reference Language Crash Course. In this uh, course, I'll be going over the basics for the OCR Reference Language. Some warnings to be said, this isn't an actual programming language, but it is based on the Python and Java programming language, with a few extra bits added. In addition, what I'll be showing right now is actually quite cut back, so not everything will be covered, and what is covered will be skimmed. So, you're not going to get a full understanding. I'd recommend watching more full videos later on. To start with, we have comparison operators. These are used to compare data. As you can guess from the symbols, it's quite easy to understand. You have a few odd ones, such as the not equal to, but they're easy enough to remember. There is one common mistake people make, and that's when using the equals to, they only put one mark. The thing is, if you only put one, you will not be comparing the data. Therefore, it will not work and you'll have a syntax error. So just remember, if you are going to compare the data, make sure you put two equal sign. Arithmetic operators, they're used to make calculations. Most of these symbols are the same as usual maths, except multiplication has been replaced with a star and division has been replaced with a slash. We have a few additions such as modulus and quotient. For modulus, this is actually just a remainder. For example, if we do 12 mod 5, we're given 2. As 12 divided by 5, you have a remainder of 2. For quotient, we use div. So if we do 17 div 5, we're given 3. As 5 goes into 17 3 times. Exponent is the same as a power 2. So if we have 3 exponent 4, we get 81 as it's the same as 3 to the power of 4. We have Boolean operators. These are also known as logic operators. We can utilize them to put together different conditions. So we can add two conditions together with an AND. We can use an OR condition to say you can have either of any of the two conditions which you specified. And we can have a NOT to say it cannot be a certain condition. In the example on the right, we have a is equal to 1, b is equal to 2. If b is equal to 2 and a is equal to 1, we'd have the word hello printed. In this example, hello would be printed as they are correct. Comments. Comments are often forgotten and underused, but they can actually help you get marks. Comments are notes and are not a part of the code. This may help you lay out your code more clearly and help you keep track. In an exam scenario, it also helps examiners easily understand what is happening in your code. Variables are just placeholders for values. Now, to make a variable, all we need to do is the name of the variable followed by equals followed by what data we want for that variable. Variables can change throughout the duration of the program. Now, we have constants. These are variables which will not change. To make these, all you need to do is add const to the start of the variable when you make it. Global variables are slightly different as global variables can be used by any program, including sub programs. To make a global variable, just add the word global to the start of the variable. We have inputs and outputs. Inputs are ways the program can take data from the user. Output is how the program can give data to the user. For inputs, all you need to do is a variable name followed by equals followed by input. Inside the brackets, you can put any message that you want displayed to the user. For outputs, we have print. Inside the brackets, we'll go whatever message you want or variable you want to have outputted. Remember, you do need to use quotation marks if you wish to enter speech. The quotation marks tells the program this is a string, so it'll output the string. But we can use a variable inside the brackets. In the example below, we have the name, which is equal to Ben. We can put print, then in the brackets, name. In this example, the data in the name variable is outputted, which is Ben. In some scenarios, you may wish to make a variable an unknown number, for example, a number guessing game. To do this, you will put random, then inside the brackets, the minimum value followed by the maximum value. That way, when the program runs, 
it'll choose a random number in between the set range. In the example below, we have random, then the range 2 to 9. We've chosen 7 as a random output for this example. Data types are used to specify to the computer how to treat the data. Now we have string, which is text, integer, which is a whole number, float and real, which are both numbers with decimal places, bool, which is true or false. Now, sometimes the data we have may not be in the correct format. We can change that using casting. All that is, is using the beginning of the data type. For the example of string, we use str to specify that we want to convert a piece of data into a string. Now, sometimes unwanted events may happen if we use the wrong data type. For the example below, we're timesing the number one by two. If we have it as a string, we'll be given 11 as it's done two once, so one followed by another one. So we need to convert it to an integer. That way it'll do one multiplied by two to get the value of two. Now moving on to iterations, which can also be known as loops. Sometimes you'll need the code to repeat. For example, asking a password till the user gets it correct. In this section, we'll be going over the different types of loops we have. To begin with, we have the count controlled loop. This will cause the code to loop a certain number of times. The way this works is you have a variable which is set to i, which you make it the starting number. Then you put a two, then the number you wish to stop it at. Finally, you have a step which determines the next number in the sequence. For example, we have the step of two. So it'll go two, four, six, and so on, counting up in twos till we get to 10. You can make your step negative if you want it to go backwards. Remember to end it with next to tell the program to go into the next iteration. The second type of loop we have is the while loop. What this loop will do is it will check whether or not a certain condition is true or false. If the condition is false, the program will repeat itself. If it's true, then it'll move on to the next part of the code. For this example, we have while the answer isn't computer, it should loop and ask the user again. As soon as the user does put computer in, the loop will finish. This is the same principle except for a do while loop the condition is checked at the end instead of the start moving on to conditions for conditions we'll use if then and else so to use this we have if followed by a condition if that condition is true the code for that condition will run we have if else if and else if is like your first choice else if is for if the first if is false then we have else right at the end this is for if all other statements are false we've now got case select or switch it's very similar to the last one except we have different cases in the example we have case a and b then we have default when we use a switch entry we'll have the user input what case they want in this example let's say a user gives a you'll have the text you've selected a be printed now we also have default at the end this is like the else Let's say the user types something invalid like C, you'll get this message instead. Moving on to string handling, we've got string length. This is used to count how many letters are in a string. To use this, we'll have the name of the variable followed by dot length. Then if we run that, it'll count how many letters are in that string. In the example below, We've got object, which is equal to computer. If we do object, 
dot length will be given eight as there's eight letters in the word computer. We can also use this for data verification. So in the bottom example, we have if then a phone number which has been converted to a string, then dot length to check how long it is. As a typical UK phone number is 11 digits long, let's say the users type something in that isn't 11 digits long, you'll be given a invalid error. We have substrings. This is a part of a string. So again, the formatting works as normal. We have the name of the string followed by the function. Now for dot substring, we have two parameters. The first one being the letter you want to start from and I being the number of letters you want. Let's say we use the word computer and we use the parameters three, five. We'll count from the third letter onwards and we'll count the first five letters. In this example, we'll have pewter be given out. Now we have dot left followed by I. Again, the number of letters. What I'll do is from the start of the word, it'll count however many letters you want. We'll use four for the example and we'll use computer again. So we'll be given comp as that's the first four letters of the word computer. Write, we'll do it from the other side. So from the end, Let's use the word science. We'll be given NCE as that's the last three letters of the word science. We have this long complicated word, which just means to add two words together into a single word. You can add multiple words as I've done in the example. So we have the first name followed by the second name. We've put an underscore in between. So if we do print the value of this, we'd get Ben underscore Foster. We can convert strings to upper cases and lower cases using the ending dot upper or dot lower. This is quite self-explanatory. So in the example below, we have the name Ben. Then we've put name dot upper to convert it all to uppercase and we get the name in capital letters. ASCII conversions. Not really sure when you'd ever use this, but it's nice to know you can if you ever need it. So to convert ASCII to its denary value, we have ASC. Then to do the other way around, we have CHR to convert deanery to ASCII. In the example, we have A and if we type that in, we'll have it return the value of 65. Now on the next example, we have character 97 and we'll be given back lowercase a as 97 is A in ASCII. This is where things get a bit more complicated. We can use text files, which are external sources of data. Now, to use a file, we need to have a file. You'd either already have one or you'll need to make one. So let's make one for this example. We'll do new file, then brackets. In the brackets will be the name of the file. Now we have a file, we need to be able to open it into the program. So what we'll use is open brackets. Now, in the example below, you have to assign the value of that text file into a variable. So we'll be using the variable x and assigning it to whatever content was in the test file. Now we have the file mounted, we need to be able to write data to it. This is where write line comes into. For this example, we'll use write line to add the variable name. What you will have to do is put the name of the variable you've used as a placeholder for the file, followed by dot write line, and then in the brackets, whatever you want. We've put name as that's what we want to put inside. Okay, now we have a file with text inside of it. Let's say we want to read it. What we'll need to do is print, followed by the variable holder, then by dot read line. The brackets can remain empty. In this example, if we, we read the text file, we'll be given the name that we saved earlier. After we finished using the file, we need to use dot .close. What I'll do is unload that file. We have to do this to save memory. This is a slightly interesting one, as this is used for files with more than one line. You shouldn't need to worry about writing a file with more than one line, but you may be asked to read from one. Now. 
dot end of file is like a condition more like so in this example we have while it's not the end of file we'll keep reading the next line followed by the next line till we are at the end of the file okay moving on to the last bit which is sub programs they can be expressed in two ways procedures or functions to begin with we'll start with procedure what you need to remember is with a procedure you can take in variables from the main code but you can't give variables back out so the way you'd form out a procedure is procedure followed by the name of that procedure followed by any parameters that you need parameters are variables that you'll take with you into the sub program so for the example below we have a procedure to multiply two numbers so we have procedure multiplied in the brackets number one and number two then we have print number one multiplied by number two and then we end the procedure so if i ran it and let's say i said multiply four then five we'll have the four and five go into the program as num one and num two they'll multiply together to give the output of 20. function is the same as a procedure except we can actually return values so what you will need to do is format it the exact same except the variable from that sub program we want to give back out to the main program we'll put return then it's a value remember you can only do one value to return in this example we'll be returning the value of squared so let's say i do x is equal to squared 4 it will take that 4 into the sub program square it then give the response of 16 which is now assigned to x and if we tell it to print x we'll be given 16. the actual final thing arrays all arrays are is tables of data to begin an array all you need to do is array followed by the name followed by the number of items you'll have in it to put a data value to each item you need to put array then the name then equals then each piece of data separated with a comma you have to put in the same order or else you'll have data in the wrong place you need to remember that arrays begin indexing from zero so the first uh, item in the list isn't element one it's actually element zero now let's say we want to take a value out all you need to do is the name of the array followed by whatever the position of the value in the array you're looking for is so for instance i'm looking for the fifth number in an array i'll put name then five now let's say i want to change the value of one all you need to do is add an equals then whatever you want the new value to be in the example below we have an array called score and we're saying that there's three items in that array then we're putting the values 23 278 and 76 what we're saying is object zero is 23 object 1 is 278 and object 2 is 76 now let's say we want to change object 2 to the number 2 we do score then the brackets 2 is equal to 2 that would change that 76 into a 2 2d arrays a bit more complicated you won't be asked to make one but you may be asked to read from one what you have to do is index using two numbers the first number refers to what line we're reading from in this example we're reading from the third line because you need to remember we start from zero not one so zero is tom one is ben two is hank now from that uh, row we need the second value so two, the first two says the row we're on the last two says the item in that row we're looking for in this case we're looking for item two hank is item zero 12 is item one 130 is item 2 so in this example we'll be given an output of 130 thanks for watching sorry it's a bit brief this is just meant to be a quick rundown of each item inside the ocr coding language so hopefully this helps